All right, people, super high roller bowl. That's my favorite event in No Limit to Play because it's deep stack. Play with all the geniuses and stuff like that, and I've had some success in it. Coming second to Justin Bonomo for a cool $3 million, so we're definitely ahead on that one. This hand that we're going to go over, old school, new school style, takes place between myself and the big cheese, Tom Marchese. The big cheese who's been uh, among one of the top no limit holding players for a very long time, which is rare in our industry. You know, people come and people go, but you know, the big cheese has stayed on top of it throughout. Uh, so, okay, let's go over this hand and we're going to get back into old school 2015. So old. Done. All right. So, in this hand, the blinds are 12 and 24,000 with a 3,000 ante. Both of us have a really good sized stack of over 1 million in chips. So stack depth, not a huge issue in terms of like worrying about, you know, getting it in because we're not going to be doing that, that, you know, very likely. Tom Marchese there on the button with Jack three suited comes in for a raise. Yeah, it's a bit light, but Tom has decided that his opponents are just not playing back enough. So he's going to start opening a wide range of hands here. Trying all the edge cases to see if I could find any. I couldn't. Negrano calls with 10-7 off suit. So in this case, or in this hand, uh, Marchese, he goes ahead and he makes it uh, 56,000 with the jack three of spades from the button. Okay. I call with my absolute favorite hand, the old 10-7 off suit. It's the money hand. I've been lucky with it my whole life. Worst I ever did was make two pair with it. Never lose a pot with 10-7. Can't be done. So I call. Pretty normal, right? You're just going to defend your big blind against these like little dinky raises that I like to do and then everybody else started to do. I, I gave it a good shot though. Well, the flop is eight, six, deuce. And Negrano has a gut shot, but Marchese is still ahead with Jack High. And Marchese is going to make a C-bet despite this board coordinating with Negrano's hands a little bit more often than normal. And Negrano is going to fight back with his overcard and a gut shot. So now the pot's 148,000, and it comes 8-6 deuce. Rainbow. That means no flush draw. I check, and Marchese bets 70,000. So a little less than half the pot. And I'm like, all right, well, listen, I got a gut shot. Um, here, I can, I can bink the nine, and if he's got a big hand, maybe I'll win a huge pot, where if he's got, like, aces or kings, I can get it all in somehow or, you know, um, whatnot. And it's, you know, pretty easy hand to play. Plus, like, I figure against Tom, you know, he knows I call a lot of little cards too. So um, if I check call on this flop and it goes check, check on the turn, I can bluff the river, you know, a lot, I figure, right? Because, I mean, there, I could have a hand here, right? Eight, a six or whatever. So anyway, I call. And now the flop, now the pot's got 288,000 in it. Five of spades on the turn. Now Daniel has a two-way straight draw. Marchese has a gut shot draw, but he does not want to see the four. And that's a pretty bad card for Marchese to barrel on. I expect him to shut down here. The turn card is a five. Uh, and it brings no flush draw. So it's just a rainbow board. And now I've got the, you know, five, six, seven, eight. I got the, again, I got, I went from the, you know, gut shot to an open ended straight draw with a draw to the old nine, which would be a higher straight draw just in case he also had a seven. I check. And as I was hoping, you know, Tom checks back, right? A lot of the hands that Negranu had on the flop just made two pair or a straight draw to go with their pair, so I don't expect him to fold very often. Well, the three on the river, Marchese improves to a pair of threes. And this is a good bluff by Negranu. He has very few hands that don't make a pair by the river, so it's very difficult for him to be bluffing. He'd have to have 10-7 or 10-9 or something along those lines. Now the river card is a three. All right, well, my plan was Check call the flop. If he check checks the turn, I can go ahead and like take this pot from him because old Dinex doesn't bluff that much, right? That's what I was going with for a lot of these hands, you know? Anytime I thought there's a spot where these guys know Dinex doesn't bluff a lot, Dinex tried to bluff a lot. <laughs> and this is a spot where I just felt like, all right, I'm going to bet a pretty good amount, you know? Like there's 288,000 in the pot. I'm going to go ahead and bet like, I don't know, felt pretty hefty, 110,000. I don't know what that, like, 
seemed like it seemed like a an amount that he would believe that I would you know have like a, that I would bet you know in, in that spot. And Marchese's contemplating a call, and this would be pretty sick. Marchese thinks that Negreanu might turn some ace highs into a bluff, as well as having a few gut shots that just totally missed the board. And he calls. Wow. Great call. Great call by Tom. Damn. Good hand. I should have bet the turn. Oh, you? No. I was going to bet the turn. You might have folded then. Yeah. Marchese not giving much away there. Yeah, and for Nick Ranu, that was a pretty important pot. He makes the call with a three. And this is where you feel freaking owned, right? You're like, hot diggity damn. This dude done just called me with a freaking pair of threes, okay? And I was like, what the, f you know? I didn't know, I, w I didn't think in terms of like why he would make this call at that time. It seemed just really stupid to me, right? Why would you just call me with only a pair of threes? But we're gonna, go, we're gonna get to exactly why he made this call and why it's probably not nearly as bad as you think. And actually, it's probably a really damn good call, all things considered, when we do the new school breakdown. Back to 2021, we go with the new freaking stuff and solvers and blah, blah, blah. All right. You guys know what happened pre-flop. He raised, I called. Flops, at, you know, with 10-7 offsuit, that's certainly going to be a defend against the size. I'm getting a really good price. Um, you have to defend pretty wide. His raise, uh, you know, comes from the button. So you would imagine his, his range is pretty wide as well. 10-7 is going to do just fine against that at that price. So it's pretty much a slam dunk flat. I think almost always. I don't think you really th put this in a three betting range. It's just going to be a call always, which, yeah, anyway. Now the flop comes 8-6 deuce. I guess in theory, you know, a solver would have a donk range here of maybe like, maybe even as much as 6 or 7% of the time, which anytime you're dealing with numbers that small, for the most part, it's very difficult to randomize in your mind or to mem memorize those small ones. So you, generally speaking, you want to go with what the solver out output says to do like 95% of the time. So that's what I do here. I go ahead and check. And Tom Marchese bets right around half pot. So when he bets half pot here, um, I mean, he's going to do, he's going to, he's going to continuation bet with a lot of air and he's going to do so with an eight, a six, over pairs and stuff like that. Having said that, all things considered, getting the price that I'm getting, I'm getting about three to one to smack a nine right on the turn. I also, you know, from the big blind, I should be able to win this pot in other ways as well that we talked about in the old school by potentially turning this hand into a, well, just not turning it into, just bluffing with it. So I call, turn card is a five. Now I have an open and straight draw. And you know, in theory, I think this may be a card with my specific holding that, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't run this one, but I, want, I think the solver may actually lead this turn some. I think it's a decent spot because if you lead this turn, not always, right? Maybe like 15, 20% of the time. By leading this turn, what hands raise? From his perspective there isn't a really wide range of them like if he has kings not raising with kings or queens or over pairs um may ra he's going to raise with straights he's going to raise with some bluffs there's no flush draw here he's going to raise with uh maybe two pairs stuff like that or straights like i said but overall he's not going to be raising a ton and that card should should be good for your call check call range on the flop because you know you're going to have three, four suited, you're going to have seven, nine, you're going to have five, six, you're going to have eight, five, you're going to have all these hands that you can have. So I think in this spot, in retrospect, maybe leading 30% of pot wouldn't have been such a terrible idea with the intention of following that up with a very, very sizable bet on the river if I miss, maybe even an over bet uh, of like close to one and a half pot. So as it turns out, I just check and he checks back with his hand, which, which is interesting because I think his hand um, with his specific hand, I mean, he's at the bottom of his range as well. He could bluff this because he does have a gut shot and just jack high. He could try to get me off of like maybe 9-10 or 10-7. Well, not 10-7 because 10-7 is an open air straight draw. But if I had 9-10, if I have ace-deuce, king-deuce, something like that, a bet on the turn from him would win the pot some percentage of the time. So he can check. He's probably playing a mixed strategy here or he bets sometimes, he checks sometimes. This time he elects to check. Maybe his intention was to go ahead and you know, bluff this river, or maybe his intention was to just give up completely on the hand because he felt like, you know, my calling range is going to be too strong and that it doesn't fold enough on a turn barrel. Okay. Which makes sense. 
Now the river card is a three. And for my hand, this is a must bet. Okay. The qu who has more nut straights? He doesn't have any. He doesn't have four, seven, or seven, nine, right? He's not going to check back there. I can have it because it goes check, check. I would check my straights to him. When he checks back, you can pretty much eliminate those. The question is, who's more likely to have a four? I think that's pretty close, okay? I have a, de a good amount of fours. Six, four, eight, four, deuce, four, four, five, three, four, four, seven. You know, I've, I've got a just, well, the four, seven makes a higher straight. But I've got a decent amount of fours in my range, but so does he, right? He can also have, like, he could have jack four. I, I don't have jack four in my range here. He does. So he probably, when you factor all those, he probably has a few more fours. So you would think that card, well, that card helps the part of his range that's just a four. But again, when, it, when you talk about like a capped range, his is capped for the most part to a four, which is a good hand. It's a six high straight, but you can pretty much eliminate seven, four and seven, nine. You know, maybe some once in a blue moon, he's checking back that straight, but hardly ever, not even worth like paying much attention to it, right? So now the question is, if I'm going to bluff here, which I should be, because I do block, well, here's the thing, you block the seven, and that's like, ooh, blocker, blocker, but you really, blocking the seven doesn't matter all that much, because as I said, if he had seven, nine, or seven, four, we would have heard from him on the turn. So while it's a useful blocker, it's not as useful as you would think in this spot. Having said that, I'm absolutely, non, it's non-winnable at showdown for me with 10 high, and this is a really good spot for me to go ahead and check call, check turn, and, and bluff this river. The question is, how much should I bet? That one we could run to. I'd be interested to see. I haven't looked at it again. But uh, I think in this spot, you can, you can really approach this many ways. A little blocker bet, what does that accomplish? So if you bet, say, 30% of pot, there was what? 288. So let's say I bet uh, like... 75,000 or something like that, which is kind of what actually kind of what I did. I did kind of make a small bet, which is, hmm, huh, I didn't play this as bad as I thought. Anyway, <laughs> so if you make a small bet in this spot, what that allows you to do is it allows you to credibly value bet one pair of hands. So like say ace eight, king eight, eight nine, nine, eight ten, all these kind of things, or even a six, or maybe even a five as a blocker, right? You can, you can do that somewhat as long as you also are doing that with some nutted hands as well, where you have seven, nine, seven, four, or just a four. So you want to make sure that when you're constructing a small bet size, that yes, you have a lot of marginal value, but you, you have to have some nutted hands too. And some bluffs, which we do in this case in that size, right? Um, so what about betting big, right? This wouldn't be a terrible spot, really. Like imagine a situation where let's say Tom does have a four. Let's say he has the jack four instead of jack three. And I bet say 2x pot on the river. Well, what do you do with a four? <laughs> ah, right? Because now you got to figure, for the most part, you know, I'm no longer, when you bet really, really big, I'm no longer saying I have an eight or two pair. I'm saying I can beat a four. I'm not saying, I'm not even just saying I, can, I have a four. I'm saying I can beat a four, right? Um, one of the key cards that you would want, and this is where a lot of like, really good players, they try to get you off a chop, Okay. Let's say, for example, I did have a four, okay? Sometimes, like, it might be worthwhile if I think there's a decent chance, or if there's some chance, not in this spot, but if there's some chance that I think my opponent has a four, it would be a spot where I could bet 3x pot, 2x pot, and force my opponent to call off a huge bet, hoping to chop, because I'm always going to have that key blocker. You know, one player who, do, who do, you know, who uses this concept and did it against me, and, you know, we looked at it very deeply, was Doug Polk. Um, with these very large overbets in some spots like this where you kind of force your opponent to either go, okay, well, I'm either you know, calling to chop or I'm just risking three times the pot to win half the pot. And sometimes it just doesn't make a lot of sense to do that in these spots. So you can make a case here, I imagine, some of the time, for an overbet here. Typically on a four-liner spot, you don't have overbets. You're usually going to use anywhere from 30 to 50% of pot, which is exactly what I did. Um, I think ultimately Tom calls me here because up until this point he was exploiting. And I think he was looking at the fact that he knows that I'm probably me not betting an eight, not betting a six, not betting a five. So he can narrow my range down 
to a straight or a bluff, right? And when he can do that, it allows him to call a lot easier. You see what I'm saying here, right? Because now the fact that he has a three, just a three, it becomes less relevant because I don't, he know, if he knows I don't have a five, a six, or an eight alone, and I don't have two pair really, if he knew that back then, I mean, he, he can easily call with a three. He could call with a deuce and print money because what is he, what is he hoping I have there? What is he counting as bluff combos? Think about all the bluff combos I could have. 10 sevens, one of them, 16 combos of that. 10 nines, another. There's another 16 combos of that. That's 32 combinations of bluffs that I could have, right? If he factors in that I don't have any, just one pair of hands and all I have is straights, 32 bluffs versus how many combos of straights? It's probably pretty close to maybe right around even. And he's getting a really good price because I've just laid it to him. I've bet 110 into 288. So he can break that down, really analyzing what my range looks like. And the mistake I have here, right? The, 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 the fault in my range here, construction, is that I don't, or he knew that I don't bet marginal hands in this spot enough. I do now, right? Because I've I learned a thing or two. But I think ultimately, um, you know, when I, when I saw the call originally, I was like, what the, what's he doing? Why would, he, why would he just call me with a three here? But now that I've understood a little more deeply how he was likely thinking about it and thinking about, all right, well, what is Daniel betting here? What is he betting? He's betting a straight and he's betting missed straights. That's it. So if you can narrow down a range to that with eliminating all the... Ma- like if I'm actually correctly value betting like two pairs, a six, a five, or whatever, he has to fold the three. He's got to fold, like in theory, if I, if I actually have those hands. But because he knows I don't, he made an exploitative... Uh, play there deviated from game theory most likely because I don't think I don't think from a game theory perspective against that size you're supposed to call with a three but that's assuming that your opponent is constructing their value bet range correctly and I was not you know and so that's uh uh my 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 game plan all the things made sense to me at the time but he was one step ahead because that's the kind of sharp kid that he is and uh just had a deeper understanding of my range and you notice now when you think about poker, the more you know about somebody, the more you understand about things they will do and things they're incapable of doing, the more accurately you can just rip them to shreds, right? So in this case, that's what happened to me. Such is life, but uh, it's a learning experience. And I hope you guys learn along with me as we do these old school, new school hand reviews.